hey guys and welcome back to my channel today i'm back with another true crime video and i am going to be doing the story of donovan moodley and lee matthews now this story is from back in 2004 it was literally as prominent as the Oyinene and Garabo case. It was all over the TV stations. So it's very intriguing. If you like these type of videos, definitely stick around until the end. And if you are new to the channel, please check out the rest of my playlist. I've made lots of these other type of videos and I'll definitely be making more in the near future. Now, without wasting any time, let's dive into the video. Lee Matthews was born on the 8th of July in 1983 to mother Sharon Matthews and father Rob Matthews. She's the second of two children. She's got an older sister whose name is Karen and they lived in an affluent neighborhood of Four Ways in Johannesburg. Lee was studying towards a BCom degree at Bond University in Johannesburg that was situated in Morningside. Now Bond University was an Australian university that had a campus in South Africa. Because it was a private university, this is where some affluent families would take their kids for tertiary education. On the 8th of July 2004, it was Lee Matthews' 21st birthday. She had lots planned for that week. On the Thursday, which was when her actual birthday was, she was going to have a low-key dinner with her mother, her father, and her sister Karen at a Chinese restaurant that they loved. And then on the Saturday, right after that, she was going to have a huge party at the Vitz Club. The 8th of July came and the Matthews family celebrated Lee's birthday at a Chinese restaurant in Johannesburg. It was a very chilled family affair where they reminisced about the past 21 years of Lee's life and they celebrated her. During the dinner, her parents presented her with the beautiful Tanzanite ring, which cost well over 30000 And after the birthday dinner, they went back home and enjoyed some tea and some cake before they went to sleep. Little did they know that this is the last time they'd be going to bed as a happy family of four because the very next day their lives would change forever. The next day, which was the Friday before the big party, Lee had to go to campus as per usual because she had a couple of classes she needed to attend. She decided that she wanted to take her new Tanzanite ring with her, but she would not be wearing it, so she decided to chuck it in her pocket. She got to Bond University in Morningside and immediately when she got there, she realized that she still had her mother's credit card from the previous night's event and decided to give her a call in case her mother needed to use the credit card during the day. She gave her a call and her mother was like, yeah, sure, I'm definitely going to need it uh, during the day. Can we meet at 10 a.m. at the university parking lot? And that was the plan. At exactly 10 a.m., her mother arrived at the university. However, when she got there, Lee wasn't at the parking lot as they discussed. So she decided to wait a bit, assuming that Lee was probably held up in class or something like that. She tried giving her a call, but she wasn't answering. So she waited a bit at the parking lot. Lee's mother saw one of her friends and she mentioned that she had seen Lee earlier on walking towards the parking lot alone. So Sharon decided to wait some more while trying to call her further. Sharon started calling Lee's phone every few minutes. She was starting to panic until finally somebody answered, but she immediately realized that it wasn't Lee. It was a man's voice, and the man told Sharon that, listen, I have your daughter. I have kidnapped her. And Sharon says she immediately laughed it off because she thought it was some sort of a, a prank or a joke being played by Lee and her friends. I thought he was joking. The kidnapper persisted and told Sharon that, listen, I have your daughter and I will not hesitate to kill her if you do not cooperate. And Sharon immediately dropped the phone and called Rob and basically told him what was happening. Rob decided to call Lee's cell phone again himself and just find out what the kidnapper wanted. The kidnapper answered Lee's phone and basically told Rob that he wants 300,000 rands in cash and they better make sure that they do not involve the police if they want Lee back alive. So Rob jumped up and decided that to quickly find the nearest standard bank and he cashed out 300,000 rands. But while he was doing that, he decided he needs some sort of backup. But because they had said don't involve the police, he decided to call a private investigator. And the PI said that they should meet at the nearest garage, which was at William Nichols Drive. 
When they got to the garage, the first thing the PI said was, we need to get the police involved. We need backup. We cannot do this alone. And as hesitant as Rob was, they decided to call the police station. And one of the police said that, okay, they'll make their way to the garage as well. The police arrived and basically Rob narrated to him everything that was happening so far, that the kidnapper has Lee and he wants 300,000 rands and has already ca cashed it from Standard Bank and so on and so forth. But uh, basically the police were like, no, give the kidnapper a call again and say that at short notice, you are only able to get 50,000 rands. Tell him that you can't get 300,000 rands. Immediately, you can only get 50,000 rands. So while all of this was happening, the kidnapper gave Lee an opportunity to call her mother. So she took it and basically told her mother that she was fine and that no harm was done to her so far. But they must please make sure not to involve the police and they must just listen to everything that the kidnapper says please and that was basically the end of the phone call and then after this rob would call the kidnapper once more and just let him know that listen i was only able to get fifty thousand rands it is short notice i can try get more later but at this point can you please release lee with those fifty thousand rands and the kidnapper was hesitant but decided okay fine uh they organized a drop-off point it was going to be at 8 p.m that very evening so the drop-off point was going to be the R558 off-ramp and like I said it was going to be at 8 p.m. that very Friday night. Rob explained to the police and the PI that this guy sounds very professional, like he has done this before, so he must be very careful because he needs his daughter back in one piece. So at 7.30 that evening, Rob made his way to the drop-off point, but they decided to have at least one police officer with them at the back seat, and off they went to the drop-off point with the 50,000 rands. But before they got to the off-ramp, Rob got very hesitant. He was like, uh-uh, this police must get out because he does not want anything jeopardizing this drop-off and him getting his daughter back in one piece. So he dropped off the police uh, in, the, in the middle of the highway and then he decided to continue on to the off-ramp. Because of everything that was happening, Rob was extremely nervous and because of that, he completely missed the drop-off point. The kidnapper called him instantly and asked, what the hell are you doing? And Rob would later explain that this was the first first time that the kidnapper had lost his cool and as a result he lost his english accent and sounded slightly indian anyway rob took the next off ramp and told the kidnapper that no i'm on my way i made a mistake so he took the next off ramp and made his way back to the drop off point someone came out of the middle of nowhere and knocked on one of rob's window and rob immediately opened the window and threw out the money and the kidnapper commanded rob to drive 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 Rob drove away slowly, expecting a call from the kidnapper telling him where he could pick up his daughter, but that call never came. Rob kept on trying to call Lee's phone, but at this point, it was completely off. He would try and try and try again until he got to the police station, and it was completely off. The police... The private PI, as well as the Matthews family, all waited at the police station the whole night, waiting for the kidnapper to call and let them know where they can collect Lee, and that call never came. Next day was a Saturday, the day that was supposed to be Lee's big birthday party. The Matthews family was doing a press conference on that day to announce the kidnapping of their daughter, as well as to plead with the kidnapper to please let Lee go. They will do anything to have her back. I really would like to get her back safely and... Uh and carry on with our lives. The family would continue doing press conferences as they deemed necessary, but they stationed at the police station where a task force to rescue Lee was situated and they would only go home in shifts where they needed to take a bath or to eat. They decided to try and find other ways to locate Lee, so they decided to call one of the cell phone networks and find out where exactly is Lee's cell phone and it was located at the Walkerville area. Now, helicopters and a huge search team was sent out to the area and absolutely nothing was found. But 12 days later, a man unfortunately found the body of a young woman 
and it was later determined to be Lee Matthews. She had been fought, shot four times, but she looked like she had just only been placed at the area because her body had not decomposed like it was supposed to have if it was there for a long time. A month later, while the case was being investigated, one of the police officers decided to start the whole case from scratch and go to the Bond University where this whole crime scene must have started. So the first thing they did when they got to Bond University was to question the students. Now, Bond University, like I said, was a private university, so it was quite small. Imagine a school, that's the numbers we're looking at. So it's not, just, it's not like your normal university where there are thousands and thousands and thousands of students. So it's very easy to question a lot of people and literally be going through the whole school. Then the second thing is they checked the list of visitors that visited the university on the day of Lee's disappearance. Because how it worked out was that if you're not a student, then you have to write yourself down when you're entering the university. And if you're a student, then you have to actually show your, your, your student card as you're coming in. But basically, there are CCTVs, so people knew who came in and who went out at the day of Lee's disappearance. So nothing unusual was really found. There were very minimum visitors, and all those visitors that came in, they were questioned, and they checked out. So now the only thing that was left was the students. So the police officer remembered something Rob had mentioned when the kidnapping was going on, was that when the kidnapper was angry at him, he sounded Indian. So the next thing that they had to do was get the roster and look at all the Indian students that are registered at the university. Because it was a small university, like I said, there were very few Indian students at the time. And one that stuck out was a 24-year-old Indian guy named Donovan Moodley. He was a first-year student, and when they looked even further into him, they found out that he was previously working for an accounting firm. They went to the accounting firm, and they asked about him. And the first thing they said is that, no, we fired him for suspicion of fraud. However, we never reported the case at the police station because we did not have enough evidence. However, he was fired. So things are starting to look really bad for Donovan. The next thing that they did, they tried to trace his exact location on the day of Lee Matthews' disappearance. And lo and behold, he was found to be at the Formula One Hotel. The Formula One Hotel in Santon is located very closely to the R558 off-ramp that the drop-off of the 50,000 rands was supposed to happen. So one of the police officers says this is definitely suspicious because the kidnapper essentially needed a place very close to the drop-off point where he could quickly hide off should the police come or something go wrong in terms of the money drop off. So the Formula One Hotel was an ideal spot for this. Lastly, but definitely not least, Donovan made a couple of suspicious deposits into his bank account a few days after the ransom was collected from the Matthews family. Now, he tried to be very smart about it and divide these amounts, like I said, into smaller bits and use different locations around Johannesburg to deposit it. But obviously, it added up to the amount and already he was looking very suspicious. He used some of the money to go on holiday to Durban. He bought his fiance an engagement ring and he also paid for a motorbike of his that was broken down. So in October of 2004, the police decided they had enough evidence and they went for him. They went to his house in Randburg and they found him there. And the first thing that he said when he saw the police coming through his gate was, what took you guys so long? I've been expecting you. Donovan was then arrested and he decided to confess. He basically told the police that he had been planning to kidnap any one of his fellow students um, for a very long time. And the reason for this is because he needed some money and he knew that the students from the Bond University came from wealthy families and their families would be able to pay a ransom. And Lee Matthews was essentially at the wrong place at the wrong time on that Friday morning. He basically pretended to ask for a lift from Lee Matthews and Lee Matthews agreed and they both got into the car and unfortunately he would hold a gun on her and proceed to kidnap her. And then that is when the whole 
Um, the case unfolded. He called for ransom and all of that. And he said that he decided to ultimately kill her later on because the whole case started getting a lot of media attention. And that is the end of the video. Donovan was arrested, like I said, and is currently serving a life sentence in jail. And that is the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. And check out my other true crime videos that are located on a playlist. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.